Hey everyone, it's Jared with AGS Armament, and welcome to our first video in our Emergency Comms series. This will be somewhat of an overview video where we will discuss what emergency comms are and why they're important. We will briefly cover varying types of methods and the tools you can utilize in these types of situations to communicate. In later videos, we will begin to discuss each piece of gear more in depth and take them out to both urban and wilderness environments to show you their real world capabilities. We hope this will help you strengthen your ability to communicate during an emergency or disaster situation. So let's get started. One of the most important yet often overlooked facets of personal preparedness is that of emergency comms. Both FEMA and the FCC advise people that in the event of an emergency that telephone and even cell phone communications may not be available. And if they are, they're often congested or overloaded to the point that your ability to reach emergency responders or family members may not be possible. Emergency comms means having the tools and a plan in place that will ensure you can connect with those you need to when conventional methods are not available. Having this will ensure you can contact others or request the help you need from the appropriate sources. Who we need to make contact with or listen to? Most of us will want to check on our loved ones, family, friends, and our neighbors. Being able to gather information from local emergency services such as police, fire, and first responders will be necessary. Even being capable of receiving information from the local news, schools, or other community organizations may be helpful. So how do we do this and what tools will we need? Where do we listen, watch, or look to find all this information? How will we use it? The answers to these questions will all vary from each situation but the fact that you will have the means or tools to collect it is the important part. Over-the-air broadcasts of local or regional news and weather can be found on any TV that has a power source and is connected to an appropriate antenna, cable, or satellite service. News stations will report information as it becomes available. Keep in mind that this may not be in real time and they are repeating news gathered from multiple sources that may not be near you or be able to see what's happening in your specific area. Much like television, if you have a working radio and are within range of a broadcasting station, you can get similar information that is relayed on TV. Radios are much easier to transport and require less power to operate. Probably the most widely used tool to communicate these days is the cell phone. They're small, portable, and extremely convenient. They're capable of so much these days that almost everyone owns and uses one. We can use them to place a phone call to someone in the next room or thousands of miles away. Regardless of the platform, apps allow us to do things like check the weather, communicate with others using group texts or push to talk columns, and there's even apps that can aid you in navigation and almost any function that you can imagine. So the smartphone, although it's an extremely useful tool, it does have some serious drawbacks. First, they almost always require a cell phone service provider or an active internet connection to operate. If those aren't available, there's really not much you can use it to do to reach the outside world. Also, their battery life is poor compared to some of the other tools that we can utilize, and they're extremely fragile. With that said, though, it's an absolute must to have a cell phone. And if you can have a backup, I highly recommend that in addition to a smartphone, you get an old-style flip phone as well. A prepaid one can be picked up for as little as $20. The good old landline is still around. Even as cell dominates the landscape, old copper lines are still a viable form of communication. Although not everyone these days has one, if folks are overloading the cell towers, you may have a bit more luck reaching someone via this method. Simple corded phones are cheap and work even in power outages. These, however, rely on infrastructure that during an emergency situation may falter or become unusable. I think this is what most everyone came here to hear about, at least based on the comments that I've read. Two-way radios. You may know them simply as walkie-talkies. Others more involved may refer to them as an amateur or ham radio. What they are, regardless of the name used, is a transceiver that is capable of transmitting and receiving on a specific or group of frequencies depending on the class of the radio. I'll go over the most common types for now, and in videos down the road, we'll cover each type more in depth. For now, just know that many public service Local government organizations, schools, and news stations use these to relay information. This information is passed on in real time and can offer very localized reports. Many groups are highly organized just for these types of situations. One of the biggest advantages is that two-way radios rely on the transceivers only and can operate without a network or a sophisticated infrastructure. 
Today we'll cover some of the most common services or bands of frequencies that are used. The family radio service consists of 14 channels in the UHF band. Radios are limited to 500 milliwatts of output power and must use a fixed antenna that's attached to the radio. No license is required as it was designed for close range personal or business use. Typical range of these radios is approximately a quarter to one mile in normal use. Manufacturers often exaggerate the range of these radios. Testing them in your area is a must to learn how they'll function. General Mobile Radio Service, or GMRS, consists of 23 channels in the UHF band. Radios are limited to 50 watts of output power, although most models are typically within 1 to 5 watts output. External antennas are allowed, but do have a 20-foot restriction above ground. Due to the range and more power allowed, a license is required to use this for personal or business uses. Repeaters are permitted on certain channels. Typical range, depending on the output power, antenna, and repeater access, can be in the range of 5 to 25 miles of normal use. MERS, or the Multi-Use Radio Service, consists of five channels in the VHF band. Radios are limited to 2 watts of output power. External antennas are allowed, but are restricted to 60 feet above the ground or 20 feet above a fixed structure. No license is required for local business or personal use. Ranges of 3 to 10 miles is typical in normal use depending on the antenna and radio used. CB, or the Citizens Band, consists of 40 channels in the HF band. Radios are limited to 4 watts of output power. External antennas are allowed with a max height of 60 feet off the ground or 20 feet above a fixed structure. There's no limit for vehicle use on antenna height. No license is required as it was designed for close communications for personal or business reasons. Typical range, depending on the antenna used, is 1 to 4 miles of normal use. Amateur and ham radio. The rules vary across the available bands for power output and antennas. Licenses are required and specific restrictions and rules apply to each class of license. It's typically used for personal, education, or emergency uses only. Range varies by band, however, the 144 MHz band and the 420 MHz band are going to be the most useful for most users in an emergency situation. So what radios do you need and what roles can they fill in your emergency comms preps? Well, an FRS or GMRS radio is probably the most common we'll encounter. They're great for close range comms among a group, organization, or neighborhood. Relatively simple to use and inexpensive, these can allow short range communications and some models offer the ability to listen into weather and certain emergency frequencies as well. GMRS radios and range of a repeater can greatly increase the distance they can be used and due to their availability, making contact with other users can be fairly simple. With the limited number of available channels, you may find everyone is trying to use them at the same time, causing cluttered channels with everyone trying to talk at once during an emergency or disaster situation. Dedicated MERS radios are not very common and due to the low number of channels and the event of an emergency, you may find them congested in some places or if you live in an area where it isn't used much, it can be an excellent alternative to FRS and GMRS. Listening to channels and frequencies prior to a disaster or an emergency can help you learn how each of these methods are used locally and how they can be fitted into your emergency comms plan. CB radios were extremely popular in the 70s and 80s used mainly by motorists looking for fuel stops or looking out for Officer Johnny Law, today they are eclipsed by other radio bands but can still be useful in some situations and are definitely worth looking at. High frequency amateur radios are very useful. Their ability to tune into stations and users around the globe will allow you to gather information from locations far away from you. However, the licensing and using the tools will take a great deal of an investment in time and money to use them properly. UHF and VHF radios are probably the most useful of the two-way radios. They can be affordable and work extremely well. The licensing and learning curve to use them is fairly simple and their versatility can greatly help in an emergency situation. Most emergency services operate very close to these bands as well, so listening in will be possible. Repeaters will increase the range, allowing you to reach other operators around your area that will be able to provide you real-time information, conditions, and other things that may affect you. I will add, do not operate a radio on a frequency that is prohibited or a license is required without having one. 
such as the amateur radio bands, emergency or public service frequencies. The FCC enforces these rules very much and hands out very stiff fines for offenders. Please research the radios and what you are allowed to do with them before use. I hope everyone enjoyed this video and it was informative. In other videos in this series, we're going to begin to take out some of the radios you see here and some others that we're going to borrow from friends to test their capabilities in both wilderness and urban environments. So hopefully you get an idea of how well they work and whether or not they'll fit into your emergency comms plan. Hopefully in the next week or so, I'll make my way up to DDI to pick up an AK that they're going to allow me to do a full review on. You can expect me to shoot the piss out of it, maybe some torture testing. We're definitely going to drop it a few times. So. Thank you guys for watching. Check us out at agsarmament.com. You can visit us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'll put those links in the description of the video. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next week. Oh, I'm so glad that's over.